This is Deb Donig with Technically Human, a podcast about ethics and technology, where I ask what it means to be human in the age of tech. Each week, I interview industry leaders, thinkers, writers, and technologists, and I ask them about how they understand the relationship between humans and the technologies we create. We discuss how we can build a better vision for technology, one that represents the best of our human values. Hello, Technically Human listeners. Today, I'm giving my mic over to two guest hosts for a very special interview with Dr. Robert Pearl. Our two hosts are David Geithner and Roman Blosser. David Geithner is a fourth-year biological science major and a Frost Scholar at California Polytechnic State University. He grew up in Yuba City, California, where he learned to love science, sports, community service, and the outdoors. He works in an on-campus research lab working with protein phosphomimetics for protein-to-protein interactions. David aspires to be a dentist as quality dental care is a necessity for society. He hopes to go into the military as a dentist and provide a service to his country. Roman Rosser is a fourth-year aerospace engineering major at Cal Poly. He recently joined the Prove team, which is building a long-distance electric car. Roman hopes to work on designing or building new vehicles and has a particular passion for orbital rockets. His hobbies include lifting, backpacking, surfing, and reading. Our guest today, Dr. Robert Pearl, is the former CEO of the Permanente Medical Group, the nation's largest medical group, and the former president of the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. In those roles, he led 10,000 physicians, 38,000 staff, and was responsible for the nationally recognized medical care of 5 million Kaiser Permanente members on the West and East Coasts. Named one of modern healthcare's 50 most influential physician leaders, Pearl is an advocate for the power of integrated, prepaid, technologically advanced, and physician-led healthcare delivery. He serves as a clinical professor of plastic surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine and is on the faculty of the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he teaches courses on strategy and leadership and lectures on information technology and healthcare policy. He is the author of Mistreated, Why We Think We're Getting Good Healthcare and Why We're Usually Wrong, a Washington Post bestseller that offers a roadmap for transforming American healthcare. His new book, Uncaring, How the Culture of Medicine Kills Doctors and Patients is available now. All proceeds from these books go to Doctors Without Borders. Dr. Pearl also hosts the popular podcast Fixing Healthcare and Coronavirus, The Truth. He publishes a newsletter with over 12,000 subscribers called Monthly Musings on American Healthcare and is a regular contributor to Forbes. He has been featured on CBS This Morning, CNBC, NPR, Time, USA, and Bloomberg News. He has published more than 100 articles in medical journals and contributed to numerous books. A frequent keynote speaker at healthcare and medical technology conferences, Pearl has addressed the Commonwealth Club, the World Healthcare Congress, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's National Quality Forum, and the National Committee for Quality Improvement. Board certified in plastic and reconstructive surgery, Pearl received his medical degree from Yale University School of Medicine, followed by a residency in plastic and reconstructive surgery at Stanford University. From 2012 to 2017, Pearl served as chairman of the Council of Accountable Physician Practices, which included the nation's largest and best multi-specialty medical groups, and participated in the bipartisan Congressional Task Force on Delivery System Reform and Health IT in Washington. My name is David. I'm Roman. And today we are talking to Dr. Pearl. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Looking forward to interacting around the American healthcare system, a very broken system, which you and your colleagues at Cal Poly, I'm sure will improve and fix across time. So Dr. Pearl, I want to start off with the question centered around technology advances in the field and just the basic terms we'll use throughout the podcast. How have you seen changes in patient attitudes to integration of technology? In an article you wrote, and I'm quoting you here, the model uses four types. One is a comprehensive EHR system that provides physicians up-to-date information on each patient's condition, highlighting the need for additional treatments or testing. The system makes it easy for the physician and support staff to quickly order tests, change medications, send messages to patients, and monitor clinical results can also be used to find and prioritize individuals with chronic diseases who need attention before a routine visit. A second type is wearable devices that record data on blood pressure and weight. 
A third is computer-generated voice and text messages that remind patients about preventative screenings. And a fourth is a smartphone video function that allows doctors to monitor patients after they leave the hospital, immediately address new medical problems, and avoid readmissions. Are patients wising up to use of some of these resources to their advantage? Let's begin by setting a context for listeners. So first, healthcare is a $4 trillion national spend. So when you're talking about healthcare, you're talking about a massive industry. And in every industry in the 21st century, technology plays a vital role. So we're speaking about these technologies. It's important to understand there's a huge grab bag of opportunities that are there. And you've nicely outlined them into four potential categories. So there's the electronic health record. That has all your information. It should be comprehensive, but in much of the United States, it's not. And by that, I mean that different doctors can be on different systems and there's no interoperability, difficulty sharing data. So you could get the same test in three places and none of those three individuals can exchange that information with each other. As you say, the second now is wearables. So this is something someone uses in their house. If you have diabetes, you want to measure your blood sugar. So a wearable device can do that for you. Uh, During COVID, we wanted to know whether you could breathe well because one of the problems that led to death was pneumonia. And one of the signs was a lowering of the blood oxygen. Telemedicine which is a video, before the pandemic, it was rarely used, although easily available. When doctors had to shut their offices, they used a virtual connectivity, telemedicine to accomplish it. And then the fourth part is a combination of data analytics, which can go into the electronic health record, see what you need, and be able to text it to you. So let's look at a couple of these pieces in a bit more detail. What's the problem with each of them? As we said, the electronic health record, the problem is the lack of interoperability. The large manufacturers, once they have a doctor or hospital on the system, are not wanting to open up what's called their APIs, the application programming interfaces, because once you have that information and you can exchange it, you can also extract it and move to a competitor. Number two, the problem with the wearables, where does all the data go? How many doctors want to have your blood glucose measurements four times a day? Telemedicine had problems before because the laws were restrictive. They became eased during COVID. It's not clear where it's going to go into the future. And then finally, the data analytics requires the database sitting in play. I think patients have become very comfortable during COVID, particularly with the use of video technology to obtain care. Although it peaked at around 60 to 70% during the pandemic, crash down now to under 10% if you exclude the mental health services. Mental health services are an area that still has a lot of use for technology. I think the biggest problem is that the technology that's being produced by manufacturers isn't designed as it should be to maximize the health of patients. It's designed to generate a lot of revenue with minimal risk. Let's look at one example. You may have heard about this iPhone that's capable of transmitting your heart rhythms, your so-called EKG. And they're looking for a particular problem called atrial fibrillation. This is when the upper chambers of the heart, the atrium, and the lower chambers, the ventricle, are not coordinated. 
and therefore the blood does not flow as well, and you are at risk of a blood clot inside your heart, getting shot out of the heart and going to your brain and creating a stroke. It's a major problem. But the people who get it tend to be older people, not younger people. And who do they market the watches to? Young people. And what, how do they do that? They wanted to be able to collect the data to find people who don't know they have it, because people who are older tend to know, but it's a very small population. It's a tool looking for a purchasing audience, and that's the problem. What would I like the manufacturers to do? I'd like them to be able to have wearable devices with artificial intelligence capable of telling the patient every day, are you okay? Now we're changing the entire paradigm of medicine. You're not going to the doctor when you feel bad. You're going when your wearable device says you have a problem that you're not aware of. And you're not going to see the doctor every three months. You're going to see the doctor whenever you have a problem. So why isn't Apple, why doesn't Apple make this device? Because of the risk of a lawsuit. If something bad goes wrong, they are going to be responsible. And who do you sue? Who has the big pockets? And that's called Jeff Bezos and Apple Computer. So I have a follow-up question about that. You would think that insurance companies would be incentivized to prevent dire health problems from happening before they do. So why don't healthcare companies try to invest in giving their patients wearable technology to find problems before they become severe? So like prevent ICU visits, all those things like the preventative care things that we're seeing more of, but still are lacking in. Well, don't get me wrong. There are things that are going on. One of the events that happened during COVID was I'll say in quotes, the hospital at home. During COVID, a lot of patients who might have been put into the hospital were sent home with monitors. Why? Because there weren't beds in the hospital. The hospital was overflowing, both in terms of the COVID demand and the staff who you know, couldn't provide care because they actually were testing positive. So there is definitely wearables being done, promoted by hospitals. But the receiving end of that is a nurse or a physician who's now able to monitor you so that the risk goes down. This is really a risk-benefit situation. And if I had to maximize the benefit for the patient, it's different than the benefit for the company and what we're seeing in the marketplace in general. A few exceptions is that the technology that would be most positive isn't being used. But let's take it to another level. Let's talk a little bit more about telemedicine. How do most people think about telemedicine? I would have gone to the doctor. And now I do a Zoom call, right? That's how we think about it in the society right now. But think about the opportunities that telemedicine offers to eliminate what I think of as time and distance. What do I mean by that? Well, you can get care from a doctor, if the law allowed, in Boston and Harvard or at Baltimore Johns Hopkins. Why should you be constrained to the care delivery system sitting within 15 or 30 miles of your house. We can bring specialists in when you're seeing your primary care physician if a question arises. So rather than having to reschedule a couple of weeks later, miss another day of school or work, you now could have your problems solved immediately. When I was the CEO in Kaiser Permanente, we had a teledermatology project. If you're seeing a physician, a primary care physician with a rash, let's say, and the physician wasn't sure what it was and wanted expertise, a digital picture would be taken and there'd be a dermatologist supporting 100, let's say, primary care physicians. And that image would get sent to the dermatologist who would look at it and almost always could give you a diagnosis. And we'd resolve the problem, I used to say, in six minutes instead of six weeks or six months, because there's a shortage of dermatology in the United States. Those are the kinds of opportunities that exist. And very few people in medicine are looking at that. 
because we look through a very narrow lens. They're not looking to disrupt the system. They're looking to be able to continue the system. For any of the listeners, I have a website, robertperlmd.com, where I have information on all these topics. And an area I'm focusing on right now is called breaking the rules. What do we have to do differently in the future than today? I'll give you guys a great example from technology. I don't know if any of you are going to become doctors, but if you are, you're going to be forced to take some exams. And what do the exams test? Memory. Why does it test memory? Because in the 20th century, doctors would have to carry a 50-pound backpack to take all the information with them wherever they went. You have in your pocket, I guarantee, a smartphone. All that information sits right there. We should require you to bring your smartphone to the exam, not check it at the door or leave it back at home. But that's not how we think about technology in medicine today. And so we're teaching based upon the expectations of last century, not the 21st. I have a follow-up question based on some of your talk about telemedicine. In this age, it's convenient, efficient, it's fast. The dermatology example is so amazing and gets right to the core of things. But how do you handle patients who are maybe reporting symptoms, but not really getting to the core of like the issue maybe being caused? Is that where you go on your telemedicine appointment and maybe get sent to the doctor's office after because the doctor can't get in to do some of these tests or really see the issue? Or how does that work between the two of them or that dynamic? So you have to start to think about what percentage of visits require a hands-on procedure. And the answer is probably about 30%. The majority of them can be solved by a conversation, by looking at you. Occasionally, we need to do a physical examination to feel for your liver or your spleen or some other type of problem you may be having. But medicine today is predominantly a history combined with testing. So if I'm going to be doing a telehealth visit with you, I might say at the end, I'm a little worried about that cough you're having. I'd like to get an x-ray to make sure you're not, you don't have pneumonia. And then I would send you, I could schedule it electronically to wherever the x-rays are being done. Hopefully you'd go today and get your x-ray completed. I'd have the report and we'd have another visit together. And when there's a problem for which a physical examination is necessary, and actually more commonly what it's going to be is an intervention. So if you have a shoulder problem and you just steroid injection, I can't do that, obviously, virtually. So you'd have to come into the office to accomplish it. But the problem that I see in medicine is that we perceive a telehealth visit as being inferior to an in-person visit. And except in those circumstances, the majority of the time, I think it's superior. Why do I say that? Because if I can take care of your problem today rather than tomorrow or the next day, that's higher quality. And if you can do it without having to take an Uber to the doctor's office someplace and miss school and miss your class, that's more convenient. And if it's easy to have a follow-up, because telemedicine, we can just schedule a visit. A couple of days from now, if I have a concern, that's going to be better service and it should be lower cost. And yet in the vernacular of doctors, they see it, we see it, I'm a doctor, as inferior to the in-person visit. And that's where, again, I teach at Stanford Medical School and the Stanford Business School. So I often think in business terms as well as medical terms. We call it segmentation. How do you take all the people who need health care and say they're not the same? We have two segments. We have those people for whom an in-person visit would add a lot of value, and we should bring you in. Or we have the people for whom it's not going to add a lot of value. Or as you're saying, at some point, if I can't resolve it virtually, I should be able to bring you to the office. But why would we force the 70% of people who we can resolve to come to the office with all of the inconvenience and problems that then ensue? So being in both the business side of medicine and the care side, 
I was interested in seeing how those models interact in the future when they are clearly in conflict and how potentially technology can maybe bring those closer together so that they're not in so much conflict. I know that your audience is a mixed audience, so I have to give a little bit of background on the two different ways that doctors get paid, which is the economic or financial side. One way is called fee-for-service. What that means is that every time a doctor does something, he or she creates a bill, gets sent to the insurance company, or it gets sent to the federal government if the patient is in Medicare, and then a check is created. The alternative is a variant of prepayment. A certain amount of money is paid to the doctor to provide all the care that you need for this month or this year. There are different models of doing so. And the technical term for that is capitation. So I'm going to be speaking about fee-for-service, which rewards volume, and capitation, that's a prepayment that is often associated with the word value. So let's look at these two models. What are the incentives that sit in place if I'm reimbursed every time I do something? It's to wait until you're sick and do things. Now, it doesn't mean that I want you to get sick. But that is how I organize the practice around people who get sick, call the office and come in. Now let's look at capitation. I'm paid a certain amount of money and I have to deliver all the care to you. If I can prevent a heart attack or a stroke or help you through better diet, exercise, avoid diabetes, look how much money I save and therefore my income goes up. It aligns those incentives. Again, both of you are younger, so you probably don't have chronic disease, but maybe your parents or grandparents do. If they have diabetes, what's the biggest problem? It's not the diabetes, it's gonna be the heart failure or the kidney failure that comes as a result of that. How do I have incentives that align? And so I think, It's not a question of business versus medicine. I think it's going to be a question of, is the reward for keeping you healthy or is the reward for taking care of you when you're sick? You know, the physician who started Kaiser Permanente, Sidney Garfield, used to say, what we need is a healthcare system, not a sick care system. And my belief is that a capitated model of payment is what accomplishes that. And when that occurs, there's actually tremendous synergy between the business of medicine and the practice of medicine. So in your book, Mistreated, Why We Think We're Getting Good Healthcare When We're Usually Not, great example with your talk about patients with sepsis and paying to keep you well versus paying when you're sick. And I was wondering, you've talked a little bit about AI for wellness and wearables. How do you think AI intervention could change these models over time or possibly lead to a more keep you well system in the future? So you're really asking a couple of different pieces. One piece is about the incentives for hospitals and how can you make certain that they align with the best interests of patients. And it's interesting, there was just an article published this week by some economists from Yale and from Harvard. And they looked at what they called a consolidated model versus a unconsolidated model. Now, what does that mean? A consolidated model means that one hospital system has acquired all the other surrounding hospitals. So now if you're an insurance company and you want to provide inpatient services to people, and there's only one hospital system, you've got a contract with that hospital system. In a non-consolidated, now there's two hospitals or three hospitals, and they're competing with each other. And what was fascinating is the researchers looked at this following question. Do you get your money's worth when you pay more? Because there are some hospitals that charge more 
and some hospitals that charge less. And what was fascinating about this research is that in those areas that were consolidated as only one hospital system, there was no increase in quality as costs went up. What that meant is that they used their market power to force insurers to pay more for the same service. In those that were not consolidated, quality went up. Why did it go up? Because they took those dollars and invested them in better approaches to care. Now you're asking a second question. We could spend a lot of time, if you want, talking about artificial intelligence. It's something that I'm a major proponent around. I think it really will have a dramatic impact into the future. But let me speak specifically on this issue. And then if you want to come back in a more general way, we can do that as well. Let's start with what artificial intelligence needs to have in order to be effective. And that is a reliable database. So what does artificial intelligence do? It compares two sets of data and finds maybe a hundred slight variations that then lead to a conclusion. So where is it particularly effective? Visual images. So if we take women who are worried about developing breast cancer and they have a screening test, starts around when they're 40, 35 to 40, it's called a mammogram. And we take 5,000 mammograms of women who five years later were found not to have cancer and 5,000 of women who had cancer. And now we ask AI to compare the two, as I say, they may find, or the application may find 100 slight differences, some weighted more, some weighted less. And what you find is it actually does a better job than physicians, a more accurate job of coming up with the right answer. Where AI does a poor job is when you give it a bad database. Let's just say that amongst those 5,000 x-rays that we said didn't have cancer, but they actually had cancer, now the AI application won't do a really good job. So what we need is very clean data. You mentioned earlier, like blood glucose levels coming off of a monitor, we can take all those levels because they're all accurate and now see how the patient did. And we also know the insulin dose because that also comes off of a machine. And now we have the kind of objective information that allows us to figure out how better to manage diabetes. And what we find is that when it's done using artificial intelligence, or even what's called algorithms, so the difference between artificial intelligence and an algorithm is that artificial intelligence is driven only by the machine and the application. Humans actually don't even know what the, what it, how it happened. It just knows the outcomes. Algorithms are designed by medical experts. But when we know the data says that when you rigorously follow this, I'll say machine gener generated expertise, you get better results than when you rely on people, assuming the database works. Now, that seems strange, doesn't it to you? Why would humans not be able to do as well? And for those listeners who happen to be economics majors, they're well aware of behavioral economics. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for his work in this particular area. And what you see is a very strange phenomenon which is that the human brain doesn't work the way we think it should. It has these idiosyncrasies. So Kahneman looked at judges in Israel was where he did the study. And what he found is that all the judges believed that when they set sentencing guidelines, they could do it better than a rigorous algorithm or the equivalent of artificial intelligence. And then he looked deeper and saying, okay, if I take these people who come in for trial and I look at relatively equivalent crimes, what were the sentencing outcomes? And this is good information in case you guys ever get into any kind of trouble. 
If you come in right before lunch, you're likely to get a harsher sentence than after lunch. Because when the judge was hungry, he or she prescribed or gave you a, a worse sentence. And if it was raining outside, you got a worse sentence too. So all these factors that have nothing to do with the criminal outcome. But the judges try to set the sentence based upon what's called preventing recidivism, stopping you from recommitting the crime. And when these other factors, like whether it's raining or late in the day, early in the day, hungry judge or not, come into play, we have problems. AI doesn't have those difficulties. It's always objective. I'd like to touch on bias in the medical field. So one of your quotes is, even when physicians have the best of intents, their actions are beset by unconscious prejudices. Researchers have found that two out of three doctors harbor what is called an implicit bias against African Americans and Latinos. These are biases that exist outside the doctor's awareness, but are nonetheless harmful to minority patients. We've now found that Black individuals have experienced a two to three times higher likelihood of dying from COVID-19 than white patients. You talk about implementing AI in the healthcare system. Do you see AI as contributing more or less to the bias in the healthcare system compared to using just traditional human doctors and nurses and such? This is a great, great question because it leads to a deep understanding about racism in medicine. So let's start with where you began, which is that what we know is that black patients died two to three times more often than white patients. If you ask doctors why, they will blame what I like to call systemic factors. In general, you know, again, statistically, they worked in jobs that required them to go into the building rather than stay at home uh, working on Zoom. They took public transportation, buses and subways. Those are incubators for disease. They lived in multi-generational homes so that they had a chance of a child bringing the virus home and giving it to a grandparent and having the grandparent die. And there are all those things are accurate. But now if you look early in the pandemic when there was not enough testing kits, what you saw is that when a black patient and a white patient came to the ER with exactly the same symptoms, doctors tested the white patient twice as often as the black patient. Now, this wasn't conscious. So what's going on in this environment? This is research coming out of Harvard. So what researchers did there is they asked individuals to look at a picture and a word. And the word could be a positive word, smart, or the word could be a negative word, aggressive. And they had to match the word with either white or black associated with it, with a picture or the reverse. And what happened? They consistently were more able to take the positive word and associate it with the white face and the negative word and associate it with the black face. How's this possible? You know, these were people in Boston, you know, why would they be discriminatory and, and prejudiced? And I hypothesize, there's no, you can't go back and do this, this study, that it comes out of our background. 20,000 years ago, we lived in caves. Someone shows up at the door. We have a nanosecond to figure out, is this a member of our tribe or is this someone who's come to harm us, steal something from us? So I think that implicit bias, which is this slower to react positive way, shapes our viewpoint. And again, the research at Harvard is pretty strong. It's biological. But the fact that it exists in medicine so prominently, we don't do anything about that, I label that as racism. And why do I say that? When a black patient has a procedure done, that individual gets 30 to 40% less pain medication than when a white patient gets exactly the same operation. 
If a woman has a mastectomy, the black patient gets offered reconstruction less often. In fact, they just did a fascinating study where they took stories of patients. You know, these are like hypothetical. A 42-year-old patient walks into the emergency room complaining of chest pain. You know, that's pretty young to have a heart attack, but it could. And now the question is how aggressively are you going to evaluate them? And when this was given to doctors, often in a medical record, you say a 42-year-old white patient or a 42-year-old black patient, the white patient got better treatment sooner. Makes no sense. It was exactly the same stories. But this is the implicit bias sitting in play. Now, where, how does AI come into this? And this was a fascinating event that happened about two years ago. So the largest insurer in the United States is called United Healthcare. And they have a subsidiary, part of the company called Optum, which is a data analytics company. It uses AI. So United Health said, what we want to do is we want to be able to invest in people who are likely to have major problems. As you said earlier, they're an insurance company. It made total sense. So they put it into an AI database and they recommended that about 17% of the people that were in this population who were African-American should be part of this program to get extra resources to get preventive services. And then a researcher went back there and did a more detailed analysis and it should have been 50%. And headlines screamed, AI is racist. Now, what actually happened? The AI looked at what doctors did. And for patients who were of equal sickness, gave $1,800 more care to white patients than black patients. AI mirrors the database it's given. It assumed these people had to be sicker because if they got $1,800 more care, have to be sicker. No, this is the intrinsic racism in medicine. And I think AI offers the possibility actually of exposing that. So as an example, if you're a doctor prescribing pain medication, and after you do a total joint replacement or a heart surgery, you often give 20 milligrams of a drug and you're only prescribing 10 milligrams, and the patient happens to be a black patient rather than a white patient, you at least can get asked, are you sure you want to do this? This is different than your usual methodology. And to me, one of the tools to address it is to make it conscious. Because I don't believe that very many physicians are intrinsically or intentionally discriminatory or racist. I think it's part of this implicit bias that they just don't notice it. They think, I don't think so much pain medicine is indicated, but they haven't asked themselves why and they haven't realized that it relates as much to the color of the skin as the procedure and the actual pain that's being created. I think all your points are very valid as far as removing implicit bias from the medical field. Do you worry about doctors being slow to accept this AI help or worrying about something looking over their shoulder at all times with how steadfast medicine has been in its ways for so long? As I mentioned earlier, I'm writing this series called Breaking the Rules. And one of the pieces was on technology. And I talked about how physicians value technology that elevates their status and resist technology that lowers their status. I mean, you would think that the technology that doctors would embrace would be the technology that saves the most lives, but that's not what you see in practice. So one of the examples is the operative robot. Do you guys play video games? A little bit. You enjoy it a little bit? A little bit. <laughs> this is the ultimate video game. You sit there in a console, the operative robot has like six arms. It can do this operation. You're there moving the joystick, you're moving the, you do. It's so much fun and it is so, in quotes, cool. It elevates the status of the people who do that. Only doctors can utilize this operative robot. Now, what's at the other end of the spectrum? And that's where AI comes in. 
Why is that? Well, number one, the idea that a machine is going to tell you what to do after you spent four years in medical school and six years in residency. Oh, my gosh. If a machine can do it, you know, I'm not that special. And it also means that someone else could do it. You could be a nurse practitioner or you could be a physician's assistant because the AI is better than the doctor, better than nurse too, but it can elevate everyone to the same level. Now there's no differentiation. And I point out the fact that it's not that doctors don't use this a little bit, but I want to measure the enthusiasm. I want to look in the medical journals to say, are there 10 articles talking about the opportunity to push the boundary to things that have never been done with an operative robot? And by the way, there's never been demonstration the operative robot saves lives at all. And it slows down the doctor. And maybe there's a tiny bit less complications, but maybe not. And it's much more expensive, but everyone's pushing the limits. And now you get to data analytics. No, now it's not a lot of enthusiasm. No one is looking for opportunities to eliminate the doctor from the process, except Amazon, by the way, who you may have seen is now going to allow Alexa to be able to give you advice and Siri to give you advice. and. All the different companies are going to be looking at this possibility. We'll see where that all goes, how people respond to it. And as I mentioned earlier, can it, will they overcome their resistance to some of the legal issues that sit out there in play? So no, I've not seen physicians embracing data analytics the same way that they would the really cool machines that elevate their status that only they can use and in which they are the commanders of it as the greatest video game players might be. I was gonna to try to transition a little bit into how patients can make sure that they're getting the best or most technologically keep them well treatments possible. So how do, how do you recommend patients, especially with their new resources, such as that electronic health record, push for their own rights and best care possible such as maybe an arthroscopic surgery instead of cutting them open like we would have done 30 years ago. It is fascinating, and I know that you've read the book on caring how the culture of medicine kills doctors and patients. Uh, and I have in there a chapter on the nine sets of questions that patients should be asking their physicians. But what's fascinating is to look at how reticent patients are to demand in their health care what they absolutely would require in retail or what they require in travel or even in their, when it comes to finance and investing. I mean, you can go online and you can schedule an entire spring break at, you know, wherever you want to go, including your flight and your hotel and probably a, a couple of clubs that you want to visit. You can do all that 24 by 7. But if you want to make an appointment with a doctor, Monday to Friday, nine to five, call, hold on until you're able to get your appointment scheduled. So I think the first thing is for patients to feel that, no, they're entitled. This is their body. This is their health. They're entitled to demand that kind of convenience and ask difficult questions. And that's what it comes down to. I think that everyone, even people who are relatively healthy, should have a personal physician. But that personal physician should be able to provide for them the things they need and want. So I would ask the personal physician, can I send you an email? Can I text you? Can I do a video visit with you? Can I schedule an online visit? And I'd find and demand the physician out there who will offer that. Now, the challenge you're going to have is there are not a lot of them doing that. But when enough people start asking that, because I think it's just better than Teladoc. Teladoc can do some of that too, but you're never going to see that physician again. It's not continuity of care. This is an opportunity to be able to do that. And so I think the first thing is you have to ask for it. But I would take it back to the conversation we had earlier, which is what kind of program and plan are you going to enroll in? And if you're going to enroll in one that is capitated, prepaid, where the incentives are going to line up and the things that make the most sense, like using technology doctors are going to do, that creates a better opportunity than 
when the technology is being used is not technology to keep you healthier, but simply the technology to take care of you when you get sick so that it generates an additional fee-for-service type payment. I want to stress, though, for people who are listening in, that a lot of the things that we're talking about in this podcast today are not conscious. And I want to really also stress what happened during COVID-19, during the pandemic, when physicians would go to the ER early, when we didn't understand the disease, we didn't have a vaccine, and there was not enough protective gear for the doctors. And they would don um, you know, garbage bags when there were no gowns and salad lids when there were no masks. And that is the very positive, heroic side of the culture of medicine. And we shouldn't, although we're talking today about a lot of the problems, because that's the focus of your show, I also want to make sure that all listeners understand the massive respect and pride that I have in the medical profession, because there are not a whole lot of people who would be willing to risk their own lives to save another life. And yet, as I said, during COVID-19, that was the day-to-day experience for the majority of doctors. Undoubtedly, I want to say thank you to all the doctors who've pushed us through this COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm hoping we're almost to the end of this. I think we are. I think we're about to enter what's called an endemic phase, which meant that early in the pandemic, we thought that we would be able to have the virus disappear, to be able to reach what's called herd immunity. What that means is that the number of people vulnerable to infection because they haven't either had the disease or received the vaccine becomes so small that the virus peters out and disappears. What's clear now, particularly in the phase of Omicron, is that's not going to happen. That the virus is so transmissible that the virus is able to overcome prior infection or overcome vaccination, particularly in those who have not had a booster, that the virus is going to continue to be around. Now, people say, oh my gosh, that's so terrible. We've gone through two years. Well, that's what happens with the flu. It comes every year. It goes. It's not a great thing to have, but it's not as bad as it could be. And so I'm hoping, and I think it's a cause for celebration that we'll reach a point where this virus is endemic. It sits around, it pops up once in a while, maybe even requires additional booster shots or maybe even the evolution of the vaccine, but it's not going to take the lives, at least the people who are fully vaccinated and boosted. And I'd encourage any listener who is not fully vaccinated and boosted to go out and get it done. So now I'd like to take us to a topic that's probably a little more focused on some of the listeners of this podcast being college-age students. So the healthcare system can be frustrating for a variety of factors, one of which may be a lack of education on how the healthcare system works. Just like filing taxes or managing finances, most young people do not think about their interactions with healthcare until it becomes necessary to do so. How do you think that young people should be taught to use the healthcare system, or do you think it's a problem with the complexity of the healthcare system? I would start with the question how do people maximize health? And that's something I believe that we should be teaching in school. And you're talking about economic health, which is crucial. Teach the business school at Stanford, so I know it well, but also physical health. And I think. You know, that starts actually even before you get to college, because we're seeing a uh, epidemic of obesity and a growing incidence of even pre-diabetes in high school students. So it's definitely sitting there for people who are now in their 20s. And that's proper nutrition, and that's exercise, and that's opportunities to lower the stress levels, preserve your mental health. And I think particularly during COVID-19, being able to understand how you can maximize your health. So that's the first thing I would say before you figure out the healthcare system. Then I think you do need to have, and to me, it's part actually of the economic education, which is what kind of insurance should you have if you're 20 years old or 
19 or 21. Do you need the same insurance as if you're 30 years old, about to have a family, or 40 years old, starting to have disease, or 60 years old with a couple of chronic disease? No. You require different aspects. And so it's not just how you navigate the system, but it's how do you design the parts that are going to be best for you at that time. So for someone in college, what's the biggest, I'll say, fear? Something unusual happening. Your car wreck, going back to school after a vacation. You develop appendicitis. So it's the unexpected disease that you need to have taken care of and making sure you're able to get the things that you need. Where are those going to be? Mental health services are very common in people sitting in a um, college environment. Being able to make sure that you can get the um, education around various transmissible diseases. So there are things you have to worry about. And I would hope that the university would provide that for you, whether they offered it through the student health service or whether the student health service equivalency made that information available to help you discern the right decision. Now, the other thing that happened as part of Obamacare is that you're covered now most likely in your parents' coverage. So you're not making a lot of those decisions, and now all you have to figure out is how to get the care that you want, and that's figuring out how to navigate it into the school environment. But you need to understand all those pieces, because at some point you'll turn 26, you won't be under your parents' coverage, you'll have to make a decision, you'll be in a job, you'll have a couple of options, and I think that we should, as you say, train people as much around maintaining their health, their physical health, their mental health, as we do around their economic health, because the pieces all fit together. The healthcare system focuses so much on physical health in those settings. However, mental health has increasingly become a problem across American society. How should the healthcare industry adapt to improving mental health of its patients in all settings, whether it be hospital stays or just in daily life? This is, again, is where I think we need to segment the question a little bit. So in medicine, there are what's called the psychoses. These are very severe diseases. We're talking about schizophrenia. We're talking about manic depressive disorder. And for that, it requires a lot of support and attention. And there is no question we don't do as good a job we should do, but that's not acceptable. We should be taking care of these diseases just as effectively with just as much intensity as we do a heart attack or a stroke or the other diseases that are significant and life-threatening. There's also, though, a lot of other problems, and as a nation, we've not addressed them. And I would say that just about everyone at some point has these issues, whether they're mild depression, anxiety, some type of difficulty coping. The question we haven't figured out, is this a medical delivery system issue? Is it a school issue? Should your school be focused on it and providing it? Is it a workplace problem? Where should the locus be? And how can we provide that assistance to people? And we've done a terrible job. Some of it is that the problem is so large. It's very hard to have the expertise available. And I'm hoping actually across time that we might be able to close this gap to solve the problem by expanded use of technology. And there's a lot of work being done right now with bots and with other types of artificial intelligence that are able to provide some assistance, not for the severe problems, but for the other problems. The other thing is opportunities to use groups. There's a lot of data out there that the idea of the one-on-one -on -one mental health visit is not even as good as having other people with you going through the same type of problems able to address them. Supplying a medical model to a mental health issue, and I don't know that doctors always have the added expertise compared to other people who have gone through the same thing. I can remember when I had a problem with finals or a professor or whatever it is that's 
problematic when you're in college, or I can remember what it was like when I first had kids, or I can remember what it's like when I lost a job, or whatever the point of the environment is, there are those opportunities, and I think you're absolutely right. We've not done a good job around it. When we're talking about the psychosis, this is a medical problem with a medical model, and we have to invest more. The rest of the parts, the parts that come out of the society, that come out of the stresses and strains that exist, we need a better way to do it, easily available. And the last thing I'm going to say is we've got to remove the stigma because no matter what we say, as soon as you tell someone you're going to get mental health services, a little bit of an eyebrow goes up. Again, it may not be conscious. We know that it exists, and it's absolutely the wrong thing to happen. We should step in early enough to prevent things from getting worse. It's always easier at the front end, and the longer we delay, the more it becomes intense, the harder it is to solve it without a major problem. And I'm sure you're well aware that uh, suicide is a major issue, one of the most common causes of death in college age and even younger individuals. And that is a tragedy every time it happens. Dr. Pearl, I just want to say thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thank you again for your wonderful answers and your time. My pleasure. And uh, as I say, have the listeners go to robertpearlmd.com, the website for more information. Articles are always being written. I have two podcasts, one's called Coronavirus, The Truth, and one's Fixing Healthcare. I write for Forbes every other week. So there's a lot of information out there and I wish everyone well. And my only advice is to all of you, become physicians. It's the best profession that exists in this world. You make a good living, but every day you get to go home knowing that you made the lives of people healthier. Thank you for inviting me today. It's been a pleasure. A special thank you to this week to David Geithner and Roman Rosser for hosting this episode and to Dr. Pearl for joining us for the show. We'll be back next week with another episode of the 22 Lessons in Ethical Technology special series, so stay tuned. You can find more information about the 22 Lessons series and the Technical Human podcast on our website, www.etcalpoly.org. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll see you next week.